No matter what's up, choose to show up with love. Choose to show up with grace. Now, if something really tough is up, maybe just choose to show up with self-compassion. If you're going through something, I'm not going to sit here and recommend that if you're going through a traumatic period in your life, I'm not going to recommend that you wake up and you're like, it's rainbows and butterflies and Gabby Bernstein's Spirit Junkie app. No, that's not what I'm going to match. That's not what I'm going to recommend. What I'm going to recommend is you wake up and you say, I'm going to choose to see myself with love today. I'm going to choose to be compassionate and kind to myself today. I'm going to choose to go slow today. But that's still a very, very mindful morning. Okay, so more in the morning is probably the most crucial time to be conscious of your mindfulness and show up with grace and show up with love and bring it, bring it, bring it, bring it in the morning. The fastest way to shift your mindset in a positive direction is to choose to show up with love. If you're stressed out, if you're fearful, if you've got anxiety, if you're low on energy, just shift. Just tell yourself, I'm going to show up with love and see how that moves you forward in a positive direction. Otherwise you get stuck. You stay stuck because you, you listen to the voices in your head as to you're not good enough, why you can't do it, and everybody's doing better than you and, and so on. Where when you can choose to show up with love, it just negates all of that. So let me share a couple of examples that I've used it in my life and hopefully it applies to your life as well to help you get the momentum that you need. So scenario number one is when you're stressed out, when you are overwhelmed, when you're doing something scary or you're in doubt and you come up with all these reasons why you can't do something. So for me, it's staying on stage, you know, going on stage, doing a big presentation, even making these videos every time before doing something that I want to be good, that I'm worried about, that I might disappoint somebody. The procrastination sets in, the fearful thoughts set in because I want it to be the best that I've ever done my biggest fear is still disappointing people and instead of listening to those thoughts and how it may show up is oh um, my message isn't good enough oh I don't know what gear to use and maybe not in my case for that one but what prevents you from doing it there's logical reasons but really just fear talking where if you can decide you know if I'm making this video is it my best video of all time maybe I want it to be is it likely not but I'm trying <laughs> and the way through that is to show up with love. Like, I love you. I love you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for investing in yourself. Thank you for putting putting goodness out into the world. You know, I make these videos because you can reach people that I can't. Your business, your heart, your soul, your, your beliefs, what you've been through, your story can touch people and change the world in a way that I can't. And so if I can be a little bit of a push, motivation, whatever, to help you start doing something, that makes me happy. It, make, it, it fills me up knowing that that what I'm doing matters is important, right? So show up with love. That's all I have to do. Don't worry about it being the best video of all time. Just show up with love. Don't worry about it being the best speech of all time. Just show up with love. Remember why you're doing it. It's another version of it, right? Like, why are you doing this thing, but not from an extra pressure? You know, if you, if you feel over pressured to be great, then that can be debilitating to the point where you freeze. A lot of procrastinations, you're just afraid to do the thing. And so choose to show up with love. I love this person. I love who I'm trying to help. I, even if you don't know them, right? Some of you who are watching this video, I've never met you before. Thank you for being here. Even if you say, I love you, even mentally, I love this person. I love, I love my audience. I love my customers. Even if you haven't met them yet, it, it rewires you. It just makes it so much easier. Try it. Like, what are you procrastinating on that you want to get done that, you know, you want to get done, not that, that you, you don't want to do, but you want to do it's part of your goals. It's your ambitions that you hope one day you could be that person, right? What are you procrastinating on? And just flip it from having to be perfect to saying, I love these people. I'm going to show up with love and watch it just shift you so you can actually start taking some momentum. It's a huge, 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 huge thing for anything that you're procrastinating on that you're afraid of. So that's scenario number one, uh, the things that you're afraid of. Scenario two is is people and specifically the people who are who are negative, the haters that we might call it. I don't actually like the term haters. I don't I don't think there are haters. I think there's just people who are in a lot of pain. You know, I think if somebody is highlight of their day is to show up and leave something negative on your website, on your YouTube video, on your social media accounts, whatever. They're, they're in a lot of pain. You know, I think people are built to serve. We are good. We want to help. We want to, we want to contribute. And so if somebody, that's everybody, like everybody wants to serve. So if somebody is showing up with negativity in their heart thrown at you when they've never even met you before, uh, why would they do that? Well, they're in a lot of pain. 
you know, hurt people hurt people. And so a lot of times we get uh, emotional, you know, we don't like seeing those negative comments. I don't like seeing negative comments, even on a channel like mine where it's only positivity. I'm not making bash videos on people. If somebody's going to show up to a channel about positivity and leave, leave negative comments, how, how much in pain do they need to be in to do that? And even just seeing it like that already starts to shift it. But what if you were to say, I love this person? Like, how would you show up if you love that, if you loved your hater? Not because it fuels you to go prove them wrong and be better, but feel bad for them, not sorry for them, but just have empathy for them and say you love them. Like if you love this person, how would you show up differently? Instead of allowing that comment that they left on your video to ruin your day, to, ma to maybe make you never post again, to get into a fight or debate or respond uh, to them, you know, and try to win, win the battle. Instead of that, if you actually said, Hey, I love this person. Even if you don't, like you don't know them, you might think, well, that's ridiculous. I don't know this person. I get, I know, I understand. This is not your mom coming on your YouTube channel and saying that you suck. It's some random stranger you've never met. And maybe you don't even know who they are and you can't see their name and their profile picture is a cartoon, right? Or a soccer player. Uh, so that's fine. But even if you just say, I love this person, how would it change if you love this person? and watch it shift you, watch the chemicals and you start to shift towards you now being more proud of yourself. If you show up with love, it allows you to have the courage to be the person who you wanna be, who you're proud of. Like when you get some negative comment and then you respond in a really snarky way or you show up, somebody slights you some way, somebody cuts you off in traffic, I'm in my car right now, somebody cuts you off in traffic and you have to, you have to catch up to them and give them the look or cut them off or blast your horn. You know, if you actually thought about that, are you ever proud of yourself? Are you proud of yourself in those moments? Like if you reflect back and say, see what you did in reaction, are you proud of how you showed up? Probably not, right? Probably not. At least I'm not when that happens. And so the way through it is is to show up with love. Like even just tell yourself, I love this person. I'll, I'll practice it with random people on the streets. You know, like I'm walking down the street and somebody comes by and like, I love this person. Just as a mental exercise of practice, how do you show up? Instead of just being head down, ignoring them, you know, looking at your phone, maybe you give them a smile. It feels really weird, especially as an introvert, shy person. Um, I don't go up and say hi to people, but it's a good practice to get into. But especially for the haters. Like, uh, Number one and two, one is, again, you're afraid, you're stuck, you're overthinking, stressed out. And number two is you're you're also afraid, but of people's opinions and specifically the negativity that's out there. What they do is they prevent you from taking action. You, it keeps you out of momentum. You're just stuck in fear zone instead of creation zone. And so the opposite of fear is love, right? It's not hate. Like the opposite of love isn't hate. The opposite of love is fear. And so it allows you to get out of the fearful mindset and into a loving mindset, which is not just foo-foo, 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 what, I don't know, F fluffy. It's not, it's not, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It gives you into momentum mode. Moving from fear to love allows you to take action. And that's what makes it super practical. So have love even in your own mind for who you're trying to serve and what you're trying to create. Have love for any negativity, any people who are who are criticizing you. They're not haters. They're just people in a lot of pain and show them love and watch how it shifts you into momentum. And then the third uh, scenario is loving for yourself. A lot of times we just need to love ourselves more. So it's the first two are love that are outwardly pointed, right? Out toward our customers or the audience, towards people who are disagreeing with us or disrespecting us or hating, hating on us. Uh, but the third one is just self-love, more self-compassion, self-love, love that you showed up today, love that you decided to watch this video today, love that you're, you're fighting to chase down your goals and your dreams, even in the face of not getting a lot of results or not being where you want to be. You know, you're you're probably not where you want to be right now. And maybe you're not proud of the week that you've had or the day that you've had or the month that you had or the year that you've had that you could have done better. You should be you should be further ahead, right? Has you ever thought has, has that ever popped into your mind? So self-love again allows you to get into momentum. So what can you be proud of yourself for? So love that you showed up, love that you're trying today, love that you're watching this video right now, love that you're making another attempt, even if you fail that a million other times, you're trying again, like love that, love that you're starting, love that you're learning, love that you're adapting, love that, love that you're gonna put 
your fourth, your best shot this time. And, and maybe this is the one that actually sticks. Like love that about yourself as opposed to just beating yourself up and say, oh, well, here I am again. You know, another thing that's not going to work because again, that keeps you stuck. So all of this does two things. It allows you to actually build the thing that you want to build. Right. It allows you to be proud of yourself. It allows you to start getting more results, start getting closer to your dreams because you're showing up with love instead of fear. Right. Love is the opposite of fear. And two, it allows you to have more fun along the way so that you're not just constantly stressed out of jumping from one problem to another problem to another problem to another problem. Because entrepreneurship is a lot of problems, right? You have a lot of problems running your business a lot. And, and we're professional firefighters just constantly putting out fires. So if you can do that with love, it's a lot more fun. This is a lot more fun. So it allows you to be more productive and effective and it's a lot more fun. And so I think lo love is a strategy. Love is a secret ingredient. And it's something that I need to, I'm not perfect at it. I need to constantly remind myself of it. This video is a great refresher for myself as well. And the more that you can have that as a reminder in your daily environment, as a, as a mantra, as something that you live your life by, to choose to show up with love for your customers, for your haters, and for yourself. If you can start to embody that even 5% of the time, your entire life changes. Also, to make sure you're actually taking action after watching this video, I've designed a special free worksheet just for this video. The worksheet will highlight all of the lessons learned in this video, as well as pull out our three favorite learnings and quotes that will inspire you to actually do something. The worksheet will also give you space to write down what your key takeaways are and your specific plan of action to make sure you're getting results. If you want the worksheet designed specifically for this video, absolutely for free, there's a link in the description below. Go click on it and start building the momentum in your life and your business. I'll see you there. If you're in that job where you're feeling like this isn't working for me, I'm not into it, I'm mad about it, I get, I get, I get upset every time I walk into the office. The thing that you're missing here is that and she's looking at me, she's like, what's she gonna say? I need to, I need to know, I should, give it to me, Gabby, give it to me. The thing that you're missing is that when you appreciate what you do have, you create more of what you want. Appreciating even the job that isn't the one that you want forever actually helps you attract the next career path. And you think it's counterintuitive because you're thinking, well, I don't want to appreciate this thing I don't want. That's sending out a message to the universe that I want something I don't want. Actually, no. The more you appreciate what's in front of you, the more you become a magnet for what it is that you desire. So if you appreciate that job that's not that great, and you bring an energy that's a little bit more of a high vibe frequency, and you show up to work and you've got a better attitude, and people start to like you a little bit more because you're in that appreciation of whatever's around you, and they start to see you a little bit differently and then maybe they give you a raise or maybe they see some potential in you. Or maybe one day you're just in a really good mood because you've been appreciating everybody and you're not, you're not mad anymore. You're not complaining on your Instagram about how you hate your job. And you're walking through the office and you're in a really good mood and you get in the elevator and you bump into somebody and they say, oh, what do you do? And you say, I'm a copy editor at this company and blah, blah, blah. And they say, oh, how interesting. We've been looking for a copy editor. Because it's your energy and your appreciation that creates that opportunity. So the more that you're in an energy of lack or fear or negativity, the more likely you are to deflect the creative possibilities in your life. The more you are to deflect the new opportunities and the less fun you have, real, you know what I mean? Like the key to attracting what you want people is to have fun, straight up, have fun. Obstacles are detours in the right direction. So maybe you can begin to look at your obstacles of maybe that divorce is an opportunity, a, a detour in the right direction, an opportunity to start to love yourself some more. Maybe that loss of that job is an opportunity to begin to do that thing you've been dreaming of. Maybe that diagnosis is an opportunity to get closer to God. Take that in. Let's reorganize your obstacles right now. What are the opportunities? What is the detour in the right direction? In what way can you begin to turn it upside down and see it as an opportunity to thrive and an opportunity to get more connected to the truth?
Many of us have issues with productivity. Maybe we are overly productive, but we're feeling burnt out all the time, or we're not productive at all because we don't know where to start. I found personally being in business for myself for the last 20 years that I have been a little overly productive. I almost did too much and I was constantly multitasking and making things happen and just moving so fast that ultimately I really burnt out. And I started feeling brain fog, I was feeling disoriented, I couldn't focus, I was feeling like even though I for so many years was priding myself on the fact that I could get so much done at one time, I actually don't think I was being nearly as productive as I could have been. So I hit a bottom recently with this productivity overload and I realized that I had to change my patterns, I had to change my ways. I was then blessed, um, I said a prayer, I said I need some help with my brain fog and I need some help with my productivity issue. And I that day got an email from the Dr. Oz show asking me to come on and do a segment with this lovely author and Dr. 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 Mike Dow. And me and Mike had been in touch many years, um, for many years, just because he had been an author. We were published by the same publishers. And Mike had written a book about brain fog. So that day, I'm like, thank you, universe. You're giving me exactly what I need. I go on Dr. Oz with Mike, and I'm backstage with him. And I'm like, listen, I'm feeling so chaotic, and I'm multitasking so much, and my, my I feel like I've got brain fog, and I'm, I'm forgetting things. And he looked at me and says, how much are you doing at one time? And I said, oh, Mike, I'm doing a million things at once. I have a 1,000 tabs up on my screen. And he's like, these are big brain no-nos. And they're also productivity no-nos is what he said. Because he said that the more I try to do and the more I try to multitask, the less I'm actually getting done. So he gave me a tip that I wanna share with you that has changed everything for me. And his suggestion was to just do five things a day to make a list of the five most important things that I need to do that day and not do number two until I've completed number one. And then once I complete number one, move on to number two, then on to number three. And if I don't get through all five in one day, I'll just pick up the fifth the next day or wherever I left off, I'll pick up the next day. And to really stick to that list and not move back and forth and not try to make a million other things added onto that list and just be really committed to that five task list. I did it. I started to just be very clear about the five things I was doing in a day. I told my team, I made a, uh, a list in my base camp, which is where we keep all of our notes, and I made it really clear to myself, these are the only five things I'm doing throughout the day. As a result of making it super clear and conscious to myself that I was only gonna do five things, I have been more productive, I have created more, I have been more intuitive, I have been more inspired, and I've been more creative. You are a prime example of what it means to be a super attractor. You're in joy, you're having fun, you're not attached to the outcome. That's how your entire career began. I'm not attached to the outcome and I'm just going to do something in, the, in, in service and in love and inspiration and it's going to become this thing. Mm-hmm. And that's how I've built my career too. The biggest blocks to being a super attractor is the comparison and the belief that there's not enough to go around. And I actually wrote a whole chapter in the book called There's More Than Enough to Go Around. Love that, yeah. And it's for that person that's like the pusher that I identified in the book, the person that's like, if I don't do it, it won't happen. And everybody around me is better than me, or I'm not, or I'm better than everybody else. And that separation and that judgment and that self attack and all the ways that we feel unworthy. And so when we start to identify the ways that we're pushing and controlling, we can begin to unpack that. And I guide the reader in the book to unpack that behavior and to recognize how much it's blocking someone from, from allowing and letting what they desire to come into their life. Because the real secret is to feel good. The secret is to love where you are in the moment and not compare yourself to where you think you should be. Because once you start just being psyched about what is, more of what you desire comes to you. And I I can stand behind that wholeheartedly. So I get a call from my one of my team members and she's like, uh, don't go on Facebook. <laughs> I was like, what? And she's like, there's a whole f- person's Facebook page and they're railing on you and they're going off about you. And maybe like 30 people had chimed in being like, oh, you hate Gabby Brzee? Thank God somebody's talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> Just like, you know, going yes. after me. Yeah. And while 30 people is a small number in the grand scheme of the universe, this feels really overwhelming. And, and, and even one person hating you on the internet can, can shake you to your core. So I 
I just, I do what anyone would do in that moment. And I start to go down that hole yeah. of, of shame and upset. And what did I do wrong? And how could I have triggered these people in this way? And what, you know, what is my part? And just getting so hooked into it, even though, you know, a lot of what was being said was being said without any information, right? right. Um, you know, but regardless, I didn't even need to dig into it to feel the feelings of discomfort. And I was getting really, really hung up about it, really hung up about it. And it took, you know, probably it was about a full day of just like being down and bummed out. And I remember I was watching television with my husband at night and I was staring at my phone, just being like, did more people weigh in? Like what's happening? Yeah. And he looked at me, he's like, what is going on? What You can't even be present with me in this room. Why are you so stuck in this? And I was like, it feels so horrible to be, you know, pounded on, on the internet. And I'm so upset about it. And he said, listen, you've got it all wrong, girl. This is what my husband became a guru. And he said, you are focusing all your energy on these 30 people who are hating you, but you have thousands of people on your DM on Instagram that are trying to send you love, that are asking you questions, that want your support, and you don't even know how to find your DM. <laughs> <laughs> you and me were in the same boat right. for a long time. I know I yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's like, you don't even know how to find it. He's like, let yeah. me show you how to find your DM and focus on the people that need you, not on these people that are hating on you. So I spend the next four days just DMing, DMing, DMing. Like I went on my Instagram, I was like, yo, who wants to DM? Like, let's talk. <laughs> And so I'm just like in it and in it and yeah. I'm just feeling so like within 48 hours, I was just like so transformed by just being in the service of others and connecting to the people that really wanted to, to hear from me and wanted my support. And what happened that was so, so transformational was I woke up one morning a few days into this and I woke up at like 5 a.m. and I was, I was upset by the, I was still a little upset yeah, the by the thought this. came right back yeah. in. Oh, of there course. they are. Why are they talking about me? Of course. And in that moment, I was like, okay, Zach said, get on DM. So I get back on my DM and I start DMing and I see this girl and she's talking to me and she's saying, you know, listen, I um, was sober for two years. I just went out. I feel like I'm, I want to commit suicide right now. I start DMing with her. Within the hour, I'm on the phone with her. And that day, she made a commitment to go back to recovery. Mm. So I have deep gratitude for those haters because those haters gave me this beautiful opportunity to be of service to somebody and potentially save her life and, 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 and also just get over it. I have a very important lesson that's something I've been applying in my own life. And a girlfriend of mine called me yesterday and she said that she was feeling really attacked and judged by someone at work. And my response was, don't defend yourself, don't fight back, don't judge back. Your work, I said to her, is to, the moment that you feel judged and attack, do something immediately to make somebody else feel loved. So when you feel as though someone has attacked you, judged you, bullied you, done anything to make you feel inadequate or unlovable, do the opposite. Do the exact opposite. Go and do something to make other people feel good. So go make somebody feel lovable, adequate, and good enough. And that simple practice of just taking yourself out of the knee-jerk reaction to, to fight back or defend, but instead to go give love, that can change everything for you. When you feel judged, immediately go give love. Go do something kind, do something compassionate, do something loving. That will be the quickest way to stop the momentum of the negative energy. There are way too many haters out there. There's so much negativity, there's so much bullying, and there's so much attack and judgment. And that's why I wrote an entire book about this topic. So my hope for you is that when you feel judged or attacked, instead of attacking back, you go give love. You do something to make somebody feel good. You do something that's based in compassion and love and joy. You make somebody, you make someone feel good about themselves. When you, before I, I mean, this must have been five years ago that we did an interview and it was before I really understood why I was so in control, why mm -hmm. I was needing to be, because I hadn't remembered my trauma and I had, you know, I was living in fight or flight. I was an extreme pusher. Uh, and in that energy, yeah. we may be able to create some successes, but we will never have that that life that is what we truly want. Fulfillment, inner peace. And we block bigger stuff, too. Yeah. We block bigger stuff. We block it because our energy is just so frenetic. Yeah. Uh, there's also the, 
you know, the person who's like the manic manifester who is mm-hmm. very a lot of my audience can identify with this <laughs> they're like you know reading all the books you know reading watching Lewis House watching this right, med- right. you know doing this meditation every single day blah, 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 and they're just like why am I not manifesting why am I not manifesting but it's because they've made their spiritual practice another form of addiction what is the thing that they need to let go of the most if they are doing the habits and they are doing the steps and they are following your work and- you just said it they just need to let go mm-hmm. it's like you can practice these principles but not because you think you're going to get something you have to practice these principles so that you feel good and this isn't actually a book on how to get things though it sounds like it it's a book on how to feel good yeah because when we feel good we're super attractive we attract more yeah super attractive the first step to feeling good is to decide to stop feeling bad i've been really working on getting honest and telling the truth and being forthcoming about how i'm feeling I know this is something that can be very squirrely for people. We can get really hung up about actually saying how you feel and telling the truth. But when we don't tell the truth, we actually stifle our energy, we create toxic relationships, we carry resentments, and it builds up and builds up and builds up. So I've gotten into the practice of just just radically telling the truth wherever I am, however I need to be authentic and truthful about what I'm feeling. But I have a few steps that I think are important that you need to take before you actually give that truth over. Because if you share your truth without cleaning up your side of the street, it'll feel like an attack, it'll feel like judgment. So the process of telling the truth is quite simple. First, take a look at your side of the street. Look at what's up for you. If you feel called to get honest with somebody, what is it within you that's feeling triggered? What is it that's that's feeling activated? And do whatever you need to do to clear that, whether it be forgiving yourself, forgiving the other person, saying prayers for that other person, sending loving energy to that other person, and clean up the energy before you bring over the truth. Because you don't wanna show up with this nasty attitude because your truth won't be heard. You need to bring your truth with a lot of light so that they can see their light reflected back to them. So the process is really simple. Look at your side of the street before you show up and tell the truth, and then be prepared to get honest from a place of love. If you can tell the truth from a place of love, then you will be heard. And that's when you feel healed, and that's when a healing can be offered up to the relationship. But as long as you're telling the truth from a place of negativity or judgment, it will not be heard and it won't work. I learned this the hard way, unfortunately, but the experience has given me this great opportunity to learn how to tell the truth with grace and power. The benefit of telling the truth is that you start to feel like you're taking care of yourself. You start to feel like you're owning your voice, you're owning your needs, you're protecting yourself when you need to protect yourself, and you're sticking up for what your values are no matter what. And you're also just you know, really getting clear about what your boundaries may be within certain relationships. And so sometimes people may not like your truth, but you could always trust that if you're sharing your truth from a place of love, you will be heard. Even if they get defensive, even if they get upset, that your loving presence is enough to allow that truth to come through in a very authentic way. The other part that may be very helpful is once you've told your truth, Give the person their opportunity to tell their own. Hold that space for them to say how they feel. There's always two sides to every story. So speak up and then allow the other person to speak up, clearing that space for the truth to unfold and trusting that the truth will totally set you free. My mom always always said this to me for my entire life. The truth will set you free. The truth will set you free. And I believe that we all want freedom. We want freedom from resentment, freedom from anxiety, freedom from fear. And that freedom is available as we start to open up to the truth within us. I write in the book about how I'm going to push the metaphysical envelope and I'm going to go to places I haven't gone before. And I never went there before because I didn't want to alienate my reader. And I had a lot of new seekers that were joining me on this journey. But I feel right now that people are completely ready for this conversation and they can take it or leave it and and make it their own. And my beliefs do not have to be theirs. So that's a really important point that whatever we believe when we think about a higher power or spiritual presence is what we believe. And all that matters is that you believe it, not that someone said it's this or that. It's, yes. it's, 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 it may be a religious spiritual belief system. It may be a, a belief system from your childhood. It may be something that you read in a book that resonated with you. You decide. That's the beautiful thing about being on a spiritual path. But what I share is what I believe to be true about 
what it means to connect to the voice of our higher self, our inner guidance system, and our inner wisdom, versus what it means to rely on a guide or an angel or a deceased family member uh, or a loved one. And so I believe we all have these, te- this te- we all have a team of, of guides, of, of spiritual guides that work on our behalf all the time. And what they're there for is often to guide, or be a bridge for our thoughts. So when our thoughts are in those low vibrations, if we pray to a guide or we pray to God or we pray to, to an angel, we can say thank you for, for bridging my thought from this low vibrational fear-based belief system to a higher vibe. And the way that they would do that may be by putting a book in front of you or guiding you to an episode of Marie TV that is going to just change your mind. So guides work through the internet and books and people and, 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 your, and your subconscious. And so you're going to maybe when you have those moments where you're like, I have this sense that I need to to watch that episode of Marie TV right now. Maybe somebody watching just got the hit. Yeah. That could have been your guide just giving you that boost of inspiration. Watch that. Yeah. Watch that because that's going to change you. And so don't underestimate those moments of synchronicity because there's support that's leading you in those synchronistic moments. And so the more that we align with our spiritual belief systems and the more we allow ourselves to accept that it's good to feel good, and the more we use things like the emotional guidance scale or the choose again method or any of the methods in this book, the better we feel. And the better we feel, the more we can hear the guidance that we're receiving. Yeah. The guidance is always there, but we block it. We cut it off. And so we can open up to that guidance. When you notice that you're in that story and that trauma of your, you know, negativity, fear, or judgment attack that's making you feel bad, notice it. Notice the thought right away. And then you say, how is this thought making me feel? That's step one. Notice the thought and how is it making me feel? And the second step is to forgive yourself for having the thought. Mm, not beating yourself up. Why am I, I used Don't, to do this all my yeah, life. Why I'm am I having such an idiot. Why am yeah. I so stupid? Why yeah. can't I figure this out? Yeah. What is wrong with yeah. me? Forgive that was my you. pattern I know. for years. I know. I know. Oh. So how do we get out of that? Forgive yourself for having the thought. Forgive mm. the thought. If you can't forgive yourself for having thought, because that just feels too heavy for yeah. you, just forgive the thought. Like, okay, that's, that's that thought again. That's from my childhood trauma. That's from my, you know, my fear of this. That's from whatever. There it is again. And then the third step is to start to proactively choose again. And this is where we begin to reach for the next best feeling thought. We reach for, this is uh, um, very influenced by Abraham Hicks, which Mm -hmm. is written, you know, mentioned 23 times in that book. What was it called? Like the purge of appreciation or something? They they do the rampage of appreciation. Rampage of appreciation. Yeah, Yeah. So when you're going to choose again in that third step, you're going to reach for a thought that you believe in. So what if you don't believe in any good thoughts? You, you, have, you have a thought that could be better. And here's, here's what it could be. It could be, I can turn on Lewis Howes' podcast mm-hmm. right now and that might make me feel better. Mm-hmm. That, that's, a, that's a thought, right. right? Or I have that book that I could open a page to and maybe it will give me inspiration. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, just something as simple as like, I'm going to go for a walk for mm-hmm. five minutes. That might make me feel yeah. better, right? So, and then you keep going. You keep reaching for it. So you reach for the thought, uh, I'm going to go for a walk. Mm-hmm. I'm going to let myself feel better. And then you go, you know, you, you go for that walk and uh, I'm going to just listen to some music. That music might make me feel better. Or the next thought could be, I actually have dinner tonight with my friends. So that will be great. And I can bring myself to that. Uh, but little things like my credit card got stolen yeah. and I'm on the phone with the credit card company and I'm, I'm trying to get out of the hotel with my son and I have a nanny with me. So like the, my nanny's like, uh oh, the baby pooped, you know, and I'm on the phone with the credit card company and there's no Uber in Santa Fe and the baby's pooped and you're just like, you know, these moments. And so I start going into the, I'm out of control, brr, I'm freaking out. And so I notice it really quickly now. I witness the thought. I forgive myself for acting out and being rude to the woman at the credit card company. And then I choose again. Mm. Okay, let's change the poopy diaper. Let's get in the car. Let's have let's, fun with this moment. Yes, I could have carried that <clears throat> negative thing all the way down to Santa Fe and having lunch, but I decided to turn it around quickly. Yeah. And that's how we can, we can start to live like that. And Cheryl says, what is Gabby's biggest fear? <sighs> Good question. Um, you know, I think that, I think that, I don't even want to say them out loud. Yeah. How about that? Cool. That's even funnier than me. Yeah. Yeah, because I don't want to bring energy to it. Yeah, sure. You know? I like that. Can no. you expand on that then? Well, expand here's the deal. Awesome. We all have fears. Mm-hmm. No, no matter how committed to love we are, no matter how deeply, deeply connected we are to our own our own spiritual practice and to God and to the universe, we will always have fear, you know, unless we somehow become enlightened, which is possible. 
but we will live with fear. And it's, it's, it's not that the fear goes away completely as a spiritual student. It's just that you don't believe in it anymore. So when you ask me to share my fears, it's like talking about something that it's like not true for me. So of course there's fear and they pop up and they're, you know, it's present, but it's, it's not real for me. So it feels like, uh, like I'm doing the world a disservice to say it out loud. I live up in the country most of the time and I have a very good, fr a new friend. She just had a baby. She's up in the country, living in the country and she kept her, her apartment in New York City because she's like, I'm a New Yorker, I just gotta keep my apartment. You know, so she's cutting checks every month and she's not, not there. And she said, my landlord's raising my rent. I don't know what to do. And I was like, okay, let me ask you a few questions. I said, how does it feel to think about writing those checks every month to something that you're not using? And she said, oh, that does not feel good. I said, how does it feel to, to think about getting that baby in the car, driving down to New York City, finding a parking spot on the street of 13th Street, walking up the four flights of stairs with the baby? And she said, oh, that sounds really overwhelming. <laughs> I said, well, Laura, how does it sound to save that money, get cozy in that house you have up in the country, and then when you want to come to New York City, just get the fanciest apartment you could possibly get. Just get like a $1,000 a night apartment because it doesn't matter because you're saving that. And she was like, that sounds really fun. <laughs> Laura texted me yesterday that she did not re-sign the lease. So follow the fun, follow the fun, follow the fun. And this is the lesson here. We're always like, you know, where do I want to be? What do I want to get to? But we're never asking ourselves, how do I want to feel? And the moment that we start to ask ourselves, how do I want to feel? Then everything changes. Our point of attraction begins to shift. So we've been talking a lot about ourselves. How do we deal with friends, loved ones who are going through the same challenges that we've been discussing? Mm -hmm. Fears, anxiety, nervous, not living their purpose, you know, all of that. What about if it's the people around us that are really struggling? So be the light, right? So I think a lot of people want to change the people around them. They want to say, uh, you, know, y y you know, read this book or watch this video or do this meditation and that doesn't work. Mm -hmm. You have to, the only requirement for, for membership as a spiritual student is, is the desire, is the, is, the wa is the wanting. And so if somebody doesn't want that, then, then you're gonna be you know, a broken record. So be the light. Practice your own transformation. Get grounded in your own spiritual healing and, and live it. And in the expression of your light, you will reflect that onto others. And they will recognize their own light in yours. So you have a much more, um, like a much higher likelihood of elevating somebody and healing somebody by just being the presence of that light, being that presence of that transformation. We live in a world that reinforces a scarcity mentality. And that mentality keeps us in an energy of lack it keeps us from attracting the career path that we want, the abundance that we want, and allowing us to really live our purpose. There are six common blocks to abundance, and we all experience them in different ways. The first block is a lack mentality. And when we have a belief system around lack, we create more lack in our life. We all have stories from our childhood, how our parents experienced abundance or how they didn't, and those stories start to create a inner dialogue that gets us into a vibration of feeling like we don't have enough. And if we feel like we don't have enough, we do a lot of work to try to prove to the world that we are enough. The second block is the belief system that there's not enough to go around. We often overwork to try to get it all. We're constantly trying to get, get, get because we don't believe that there is enough. It makes us feel like we have to work so hard to get what we want. And that effort and that anxiety is really, really blocking the natural order, which is the flow of abundance. The third block is the block of comparison. We literally just turn on our social media and we're immediately into compare, compare, compare. And comparing blocks or attracting power because it focuses us on what we don't have rather than feeling good and feeling faith. The fourth block is the need to win in the place of having fun. Because when we're so focused on winning, we lose track of what it feels like to enjoy the process. And that winning can really get in our way of allowing. The fifth block is the fear of rejection. When we fear rejection, we don't take action. And in effect, we create more lack in our life because we're not actually trying, we're not actually putting out our desires, we're not actually taking that leap towards what we want. But it's important to understand that rejection can be protection. 
When we have some form of rejection show up in our life, it's the universe guiding us to something better. And the final block is the fear of judgment. You may be so terrified of being judged that you don't take that action, you don't show up for your dreams, you don't even contemplate a world where you could do the thing that you've been dreaming of. You're so afraid of judgment because you think that other people won't support you. But what's really important to recognize is that if you're afraid of what other people think and how they won't support you, it's typically a sign that you are not supporting yourself. Now that you know the six blocks to abundance, I wanna give you my methods for clearing those blocks so that you can allow abundance to flow to you. It's called the universal abundance method. The first step of the universal abundance method is to protect your desires so you can stay in alignment. So if you have a really important desire, something that you care about, something that you wanna manifest into your life, it's extremely valuable not to talk about it with anyone who might resist it. Step two is to focus on giving rather than getting. The more we are in that service mentality, the more positively the universe responds to us. This puts you into an abundance mentality quickly because the more you give, the more you will receive. And step three is to want more for others. It is an opportunity for us to see that we all can succeed. We all can have abundance in our life. And the second you start to intend for others to have more of what you want for yourself, you start to feel good. You start to feel like you're contributing. You start to feel like you're connecting and you're no longer comparing or jealous and you're no longer separating yourself from others. Redirect your focus from what can I get to how do I feel and really allow that feeling of abundance to propel you forward and create momentum and allow the universe to bring to you all that you desire. There's no such thing as a mistake. Everything happens in divine order. I am being guided to learn and grow. Here we go, people. When we look at the situations in our life from a place of regret, we ultimately miss the opportunity for growth. We miss the opportunity to see what could have been beneath that discomfort. We miss the opportunity to acknowledge and recognize that every experience in our life is not an accident. It doesn't happen by accident. It happens in a divine order. And when we live and lead and show up for our life grounded in that belief system, then we can face our most difficult moments with a sense of purpose and power and we can show up for those moments with a opportunity to grow, focusing on the opportunity to grow, focusing on the opportunity for a shift, for strength, for spiritual awakening, for a new way of being and a new perception of our lives. So that's a lot. I know that's a lot. I know that when something really bad happens, like what we've been experiencing recently in the world, what we experienced in the United States last week, when we experienced something like a pandemic, we don't want to see the spiritual assignment. We don't want to see that this is not a mistake. But typically when difficult things happen, they are revealing what needs to be healed. These uncomfortable moments, whether they be global or they be personal, are revealing what we have to heal, whether we have to heal it on an individual level, which is where it begins, and what we have to heal on a global perspective and a global level. So showing up to all these uncomfortable moments and recognizing them that they are not a mistake, that they're happening in a divine order, and it's our opportunity to perceive these situations from the lens of what can I learn from this? How can I grow from this? How can I shift from this? How can I lean towards more love? How can I lean towards more joy? How can I lean into the lesson rather than the problem, the solution rather than seeking all of the faults and, and looking for all of the problems? So I'm in this three-year journey of trying to conceive and really for a year and a half, almost two years, I was like in the low of it, really feeling like, okay, I'm not good enough. My body isn't working. How can I make this happen? How can I make this happen? Right. And really pushing and controlling and trying to eat things and track my ovulation and all that crap. And then about the fall of 2017, I started to get into more of a surrendered state. And I started practicing the methods that I teach in the book of just really trusting that there was a higher guidance that I'd believed in for my whole life and relying on that. And that's when things started to get really wild and synchronistic. And so around the fall of 2017, I was driving in the countryside where I live most of the time. And this is where I do the majority of my manifesting is just driving in the car, looking at the foliage, 
listening to my mantra music. And I feel so awesome when I'm in that position and I'm just so grateful in the moment and I'm driving and I'm driving and I'm like, I feel so awesome and so grateful that I live in this country town and I have all these friends and I don't have any cell service right now. And I'm so psyched about that and no one's bothering me and I feel good. And then all of a sudden I felt the presence of a baby in the backseat and I was like, wow, like deeply moved. Tears started to roll down my face. I felt so moved. And at that point I heard my intuition say to me, the baby's coming in March. And I was like, and it was so loud. Like, you know, when you hear the voice of your inspiration, you're like, that's it. Okay. I believe. And so I started saying to myself over and over, like, oh my God, March, you know, I have to conceive at this time for the baby to come in March. I saw myself getting a little into it, like too into it and hooked into it. So I said, okay, listen, you know what universe, I'm going to give this over. And if my baby is indeed coming in March, show me a sign, show me lilies to let me know that the baby's coming in March. And a week later, I got an, a letter in the mail from a reader and it had this angel card in it. And on the back of it was this picture of Archangel Gabriel. And Archangel Gabriel is typically depicted holding lilies. So I was like, yo, this is dope. <laughs> and on the back he wrote, I thought that you needed this. And I was like, thank you. Good. So here I am, March, March is coming, March is happening. And early March rolled around and I wasn't pregnant. So I was like, what the hell? And not only was I devastated once again, another month has gone by, I'm not pregnant. But this time I was like, I thought the universe had my back. Like I was mm. getting signs. Like what, what's the up? What's up? Mm. So I walked into my husband's office and I was just hysterically crying, so upset, so defeated. And at some, my phone was like on the desk, like right here. And all of a sudden my phone started playing a song. And the song was just repeating, repeating. And so I go like, you know, when your phone malfunctions, you're like, I'm just going to turn that off. Mm -hmm. I was like, okay, I'm just going to turn that off. And then I look at the phone and I start listening to the lyrics. And the lyrics are, way go Lily, way go Lily. And the guy keeps repeating, way go Lily. And then I look even further and I look at the name of the song as way go Lily. And he just keeps repeating Lily. And I look even further and the album title is I See the Sign. <laughs> And where was this playing? Where, what area of your phone? This was just. My phone just turned on. Oh, wow. No, that's, it's, it, you know, it's spirit working mm -hmm. through the technology. And so my phone just turned on. It was an album that I'd never heard. I'd never heard the song before. It wasn't in my Spotify and it just began playing. Now get this. So I get, I, I, April rolls around and I'm pregnant. But then I did the math and I was like, when did I conceive? I conceived the last day of March. Mm. So that, synchronicity. You know, you hear March, you find your signs, you feel super guided. That synchronicity is available to all of us, but it's when it ha we have to get out of that pusher mentality and out of that controlling behavior to allow the presence of spirit to work through us and guide us mm -hmm. and or the universe or whatever you whatever you call it to be the presence of 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 direction, inspiration, to be that guide. There's always a spiritual assignment. There's always something to learn. There's always an opportunity for growth in all relationships, particularly romantic relationships. But when that learning is no longer happening, when one person's growing and the other person isn't, when there is a leap spiritually and the other person is not leaping with, there can be a disconnect in the learning opportunity. The idea that we could be forcing a relationship, if you have a sense that you're forcing a relationship, it's likely that you are. It doesn't mean that the relationship isn't right. It means that you are trying to make it right rather than allowing it to show you what's right. Rather than trying to make someone who you think they should be, allow them to teach you who you really are here to step into not teach you, but reflect back to you who you are here to step into. Rather than trying to change someone else, put the mirror back on yourself and say, what is it within me that is ready to develop more? What is it within me that is ready to grow more? If you show up like that and you keep growing and you keep rising up and they don't rise with you, there's your answer. If you keep focusing your side of the street, keeping your side of the street clean, what is it that I got to work through here? How can I show up more? And they say, oh, okay, I'm going to be a reflection of her new shift, and I'm going to grow as a result of her growth, and I'm going to be new because of this development within her, then you are both energetically growing together. If you're here and he's not growing with, there's your answer. 
There's your answer. You know, if, if you're trying to force him to get here with you, you are forcing the relationship. Put the focus right back on top to you. Change your inner work, your inner life, reflecting that mirror back onto yourself. And if he starts to vibrate at a higher frequency as you do, you know the answer. To watch my recent one-on-one sit down with Gabby Bernstein, check the video right there next to me. I think you'll love it. Continue to believe and I'll see you there. Trauma is very delicate and we all have it. You rip off the band-aid too fast, you'll get blown out. It'll be too, too scary at once. We all have the capacity to be of service to others. 